Couple quick announcements. The uh, Prophecy Forum Conference is going to be in Dublin on November 14th and 15th. Uh, we do, still do need a few volunteers. Talk to me or Pam or send us an email about that. Um, we have some from people coming from around the country that are, have already volunteered, and some people here. Um, Russ, we added some speakers. We got Bill Salas, Doug Woodward, me, Doug Krieger, Dave Dobbenmeyer. Um, Russ Dizdar, Hagman Hagman will be here uh, doing some live remotes for their radio program. So um, be sure and uh, try to come to that. Um, I know we're up in the mid-hundreds in the number of uh, tickets that we've sold, so look forward to that. Uh, I apologize for my voice. I have a little bit of a frog in my throat. I was clearing my throat this morning, and PM said, did you say I love you? And I... Like, well, yeah, if that's what you heard, yeah, that's, <laughs> that's what I said, so, Ex exactly, so, think on your feet, that's what they teach you in law school, always be quick. So today, I'm going to, I just called this today, the death by a thousand cuts. I've mentioned this before, if somebody wants to, to get rid of you, to off you, to kill you, they can do it by one stab wound. They can cut off your head with a sword. Or you can die a death from a thousand cuts. And I'm going to talk a little bit about some things that have happened in world missions over the years. We've touched on this a little bit. And I think that this, uh, there was an article that I read, I'm going to refer to it extensively, in the Master Seminary Journal. Um, and I'll get to that in a moment. But you know, in this hour, we talk, we do a prophecy update. We look at things that are going on from the prophetic scriptures and how uh, things going on in the world relate to the things that are prophesied. And as we get closer to the end, of course, we see this convergence of events and this speeding up and this acceleration of things that are happening. Now, um, in the Master Seminary Journal, uh, this, uh, the most recent one, that's the uh, seminary that was started by John MacArthur, Dick Mayhew, some of you may know Dick, is the dean of the seminary, and there's an article in their spring uh, issue, and I will send this out if you want, just send me an email and I'll send you a copy of it, because I think it's an excellent article, it's one of the best that I've read on the topic, and it's called regaining our focus, a response to the social action trend in evangelical missions. About a hundred years ago, there were some big missionary conferences. This is a picture of one that took place in Edinburgh, Scotland. In 1974, a meeting was held in Lausanne, Switzerland, uh, at this building, and it started the Lausanne movement. The uh, People who started it were, of course, Billy Graham was the founder and the co-founder of it was also a man, an Anglican named John Stott from England. Here's a little video about the history of the Lausanne movement. The year 
was 1974. Billy Graham launched the influential Luzon movement. 2,700 Christian leaders from 150 countries gathered in Luzon, Switzerland for the first international congress on world evangelism. I believe that this could be one of the most significant gatherings, not only in this century, but in the history of the Christian church. The planning committee has invited participants from every possible nation and nearly every evangelical denomination and parachurch organization in the world. Never before have so many representatives of so many evangelical Christian churches in so many nations and from so many tribal and language groups gathered to worship, pray, and plan together for world evangelization. It was a global groundbreaking event. Time Magazine called it possibly the widest ranging meeting of Christians ever held. I have come to Lausanne with great hope and expectation and great spiritual need, asking God to enlarge my own vision, as I'm sure you have. The outcome of that historic gathering profoundly influenced mission efforts on every continent with a new spirit of servant leadership. He said the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. But this supreme atoning sacrifice was the climax of a life of service. Well, that's John Stott. Uh, a couple years later, they had a Lausanne II in the Philippines. And then uh, in 2010, in Cape Town, South Africa, they had Lausanne 2014, or 2010, uh, Lausanne 3. Now, the Lausanne movement uh, resulted in a thing called the Lausanne Covenant. I'll mention that in just a moment uh, in these meetings that took place at the time. Now, this article that's written, and I apologize for not having the authors that I'm going to quote from extensively this morning, really goes through and analyzes what has happened in the state, in the world of evangelicalism. Now, we heard a great gospel-based message in our first hour from our friend here from Malawi. But what's happened in evangelical missions and what's been troubling to a lot of people, myself included, is that instead of focusing on preaching the gospel, what's happened to a lot of missions agencies now is that they focus only on good works, social justice, uh, other things. And there's nothing wrong with those, but what's happened is that those, if those things have kind of uh, consumed the space in world missions, by and large, and the gospel has been shoved aside. And listen to the analysis of the authors of this article. <coughs> the, tug of war, the tug of war between proclamation-oriented missions and social action is not new. However, it has become a prominent debate again in our generation. Recent key voices in evangelical circles enthusiastically promoting social action and missions include John Stott, Tim Keller, and popular emergent authors. Now, Tim Keller is a pastor uh, of a church in uh, New York City in Manhattan that's been, become, he's become very, very popular. He has a thing that he runs each year. I think, I don't know if the fall one has taken place yet. If it hasn't, it's coming up very soon, called Movement Day. It, the article continues, John Stott's influence has been felt through his leading role. And remember, John Stott, near the end of his life, or before the end of his life, wrote a book where he really denied the existence of hell. It's a, it, I, I hate to say that, but it's true. John Stott's influence has been felt both through his leading role in the Lausanne International Congress on World Evangelization, Evangelization and through his many books. At the 1974 Lausanne Conference, more than 2,000 attendees signed the Lausanne Covenant, which declared that, quote, evangelical, evang evangelism and socio-political involvement are part of our Christian duty. However, the covenant also explicitly said that, of the two, gospel proclamation is of higher priority, and the church's mission of sacrificial service, evangelism, is primary. And that was good. That is what was in the Lausanne Covenant. However, the authors 
go on to point out that something else occurred at the Lausanne meeting in 1974. In spite of this clear statement, an astonishing event took place on the last day of the conference. Approximately 200 conference attendees drafted a statement entitled Radical Discipleship that gave social action equal status with gospel proclamation equal status with gospel proclamation. While it was too late to change the wording of the Lausanne Covenant, Stott, who had chaired the committee that drafted the covenant, publicly affirmed the alternative radical discipleship, discipleship position the last night of the conference. It was a watershed moment for world evangelization, especially, essentially redefining the church's mission. More recently, Tim Keller, the pastor of Redeemer Presbyterian Church in New York City, has played a leading role in promoting social activism through his books, Generous Justice and Center Church, and through his prominent role as co-founder of the Gospel Coalition. Peter Naylor sums up Keller's view succinctly. Keller's main thesis is that the church has a twofold mission in this world. One, to preach the gospel, and two, to do justice which involves social, cultural transformation and renewal. And you can read Keller's works, and one of the things that Keller promotes is that you will change the culture if you get to a tipping point of 10% of believers. That is what you need to get. So if you want to change Manhattan, get 10% of believers, and you, then you can change the society and cultural structures. Key figures in the emergent movement, which you have heard about extensively here at this church, also avidly promote social justice, not just as an equal partner with the gospel, but as the gospel itself. For example, Brian McLaren's vision of being missional eliminates old dichotomies like evangelism and social action. Both are integrated in expressing saving love for the world, and what you find is that through the emergent movement especially, the gospel is not an equal partner. It has become eviscerated. It has become consumed by this concern with social justice. Now, I don't want to just, uh, as I've said, if, if I haven't got to your sacred cow yet, stick around. Eventually, I'll get around to it. But uh, also within the, so I would call it the religious right political movement that we're going to transfer transform our culture through politics, while there were many good people that were involved in that and good hearts, the, on the other side of the, if we, if we would call the emergent the left side of evangel evangelicalism and the religious right, of course, the right side of evangelicalism, both share a common thing in that the gospel, the, the importance, primacy, and proclamation of the gospel somehow got shoved aside by politics on the right, by social justice on the left. The authors in this, of the article in Master Seminary Journal continue. Social justice advocates are fond of describing the gospel in terms of human flourishing. The incarnation, they say, was about Christ bringing shalom or general well-being to the human race. One person who talks about that is a man named Shane Claiborne. If you've ever seen him with his dreadlocks, he, uh, he is uh, based in inner city Philadelphia, but you see him at many of these social justice type conferences. You see him at Catalyst. You see him uh, particularly at the Christ at the Checkpoint conference in Bethlehem. The article continues, many evangelicals, without turning away from substitutionary atonement, have adopted the notion enthusiastically. If the gospel is about human flourishing, then any Christian effort that increases that flourishing is gospel ministry. On that basis, building a hospital or an orphanage is just as much a fulfillment of the, of the Great Commission as church planting. In reality, it's not. They continue, an idealistic desire to bring the kingdom now often plays a role in the social action vision of the church. Advocates of social justice argue that Christ came to banish the results of the fall. Therefore, kingdom work includes every, anything in the current age that diminishes or reverses those results and promotes the good of individuals and society. In other words, Christ's kingdom is brought into existence 
through the general reduction of evil and injustice in society, just as much as through gospel proclamation. To orient the gospel towards human flourishing and a general societal improvement is to step into the trap of an overly realized eschatology. It's a version of post-millennialism, we'll call it dominionism sometimes, and we're going to build the kingdom of God. To the extent that some people in the, what I would call the emergent movement, Rob Bell, Brian McClure, and Blings, that we will eventually create such, and this also carries over into some of the new apostolic reformation people, eventually we'll, we will create such a great world that Jesus will return because he'll want to come back and take over the kingdom that we've built. Now, folks, that eschatology is nowhere in Scripture. The kingdom will come when the king returns. That is what we are always told to be waiting, waiting and watching for the king. Our goal in the meantime, or our obligation, our duty, is to proclaim the gospel and build disciples. Jesus is perfectly capable, God is perfectly capable of building his kingdom. It's a version, they said, of post-millennialism. Ultimately, it attempts societal transformation that only Christ's return can bring. Furthermore, its common grace approach to the Great Commission ignores the fact that, biblically speaking, one participates in the blessings of Christ's kingdom only by believing in the King. Making social action an equal partner with the gospel, in effect, subordinates the need for repentance and forgiveness to temporal needs. Is that truth? And actually, the um, authors of this article focused on their ministry in a country called Malawi uh, when they talked about that. The sad truth is that Africa has always had poverty, orphans, political corruption, sexually transmitted diseases, and other health and social crises. No amount of money and social reform will change what is essentially a hard problem that only repenting, believing in Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ and embracing a biblical worldview can solve. And in that footnote, they reference this. It is estimated that $1 trillion of Western aid has been poured into Africa in the last five decades. More money is not the solution to Africa's problems. Christ clearly proclaimed is. Paul would have defined Africa's problems this way. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. Likewise, Africa's solution is we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. By focusing on social justice, evangelicals might be trying to help Africa in an unhelpful way, or at least not in the most helpful way. In most social justice efforts, the actual direct gospel ministry is very limited, more of a hoped-for byproduct than the overt goal. For example, they say that the 38% of missionaries in Malawi who are school teachers must by necessity spend most of the days teaching mathematics, handwriting, art, and other basic educational skills. Those are good things, but actual gospel ministry is minimal when compared, for example, with what a church planner does. I can tell you example after example of things that I have heard, and I'm not denigrating all missions, all mission work. Don't get me wrong. But I have... I have talked missionaries who have said, yeah, we're involved in a club with people that live near us in our country of ministry. They were asked, how, how is it going when you, when you share the gospel with them? Well, we've known them five years, and we're just about to the point where we're going to tell them that we believe in God. Now, folks, this, I can tell you this is a fact, that this is what happens in some missions. I am supremely confident, over 100% sure, that Finish Line Ministries, who shared first hour, is not involved in that type of mission work. They are about proclaiming the gospel. They do good things. They have schools, they have, but they have pastoral training and that type of thing. That's great, but a lot of missions has gotten off track, and they believe that the good works is just the same. It manifests itself in our churches in America, though, too, in the same way. We're going to go down and, I don't know, clean up the mall or something. Okay, that's what we're going to do. And that becomes a substitute for gospel proclamation. And it's not the gospel, friends. It's not what the church was designed to do. All of the passages that relate to justice and mercy and that type of thing 
are misinterpreted and twisted. One of the passages that's twisted the most is the one uh, in Matthew chapter 25, which is an eschatological passage. And it talks about uh, at the end when they're judged, you won't understand because uh, you'll say, well, when did, when did we help you out? Well, you, when you did it under the one of the least of these, my brethren. That has a specific, mean, specific meaning, but it's ripped out of context by groups like sojourners in particular and changed into something that we have to just feed the poor. Often lurking behind the indirect approach is the notion that the church must first portray the gospel by means of social justice before it can reach the gospel, preach the gospel. This belief has no basis in Acts or the epistles. You didn't see Paul in Athens going in and feeding the poor or anything like that. He went in and he boldly proclaimed the gospel in the public marketplace. After noting that studies have shown that Christians spend about five times more money on poverty relief than projects on evangelism and church planning, D.A. Carson warns that the gospel is too often the missing component in holistic or indirect gospel ministry. I would highly recommend, uh, and if you want, just send me an email, and I will send you a copy of that uh, article. Because this focus on social justice ultimately eviscerates the gospel. Now, I'm a trial lawyer, so Exhibit A this week in that is this article that appeared recently on Bart, Campo De Bart Campolo's deconversion and why we can't blame his father. Bart Campolo is the son of Tony Campolo. Frank Schaefer, Frankie Schaefer, the son of Francis Schaefer, wrote a scathing article attacking people who suggested that maybe Bart, De Bart Campolo's deconversion from Christianity, it's something that's documented, and I'll show you in just a moment. Uh, it's just terrible that people would say that, well, maybe his parents didn't teach him correctly. And Frankie Schaefer, you know, they should have taken him to the Creation Museum another time or something like that. Uh, but we know that Frankie Schaefer has himself gone through this process, and he now describes himself as an atheist who prays to God. That's Frankie Schaefer. Um, as he says here, Christianity Today, which talked about Bart, De Bart Campolo's deconversion, is scared of Peggy Tony and Bart Campolo and me and wants to help evangelicals brainwash their children more effectively. This is a bitter, twisted individual that's writing this. And you should go uh, to his blog at Patheos and read it. If you go to the USC, the University of Southern California's website, you will find a, an office called the Office of Religious Life. And the, ORR, OR, the Office of Religious Life staff now includes a man named Bart Campolo, the son of Tony Campolo, who's been involved very heavily in the emergent movement. And you see here what it says. Bart Campolo is what? the humanist chaplain at the University of Southern California. The humanist chaplain. Look at what some of the, uh, the description says. After receiving his BA in religious studies from Brown University, it's not really a good start, but um, <laughs> just that, sorry for the editorial comment there. Bart served as a youth pastor. Before, before returning to his hometown of Philadelphia to found Mission Year, which recruits Christian young adults to live and work among the poor in urban neighborhoods across the country. During his 15 years in that role, Bart became a popular writer and speaker in evangelical Christian circles, focusing on interpersonal relationships, community development, and social justice. Now, folks, I personally am not a prophet or the son of a prophet, but I was concerned and expressed those concerns, I know to you a number of times, about the things that Bart Campolo was teaching. That they were indicative of someone who had not, was not a true convert of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I made the same comments about Rob Bell, who is now out on some kind of new age tour with uh, D uh, Deepak Chopra, and uh, Oprah Winfrey. I was concerned that evangelicals were 
giving these people a pass when in fact they were not believers. In 2005, he returned to street level ministry as leader of Walnut Hills Fellowship, a missional interfaith community in inner city Cincinnati, and also began consulting with a variety of nonprofit organizations. Most recently, he worked with the Abraham Path Initiative and the Telos Group, group educating American faith leaders about the causes of and potential remedies for the modern Israeli-Palestinian conflict. That, uh, that uh, remedy that they, he would have suggest was get rid of the Jews, uh, by and large. Over the course of his ministry career, listen to this. This is, this is I, and I don't say this because, wow, here's another one we'd nail to the wall. This is not, I am saddened deeply saddened by this statement. You need to pray for Bar Campolo, okay? Over the course of his ministry career, Bar gradually transitioned from Christianity to secular humanism, to secular humanism. As the first humanist chaplain at USC, he has committed to developing a community that offers regular inspiration, pastoral care, supportive fellowship and service opportunities to students, faculty, staff members, and local families and individuals exploring or actively pursuing secular goodness as a way of life. Okay? That, my friends, I will submit to you is exhibit A in proving the fruit of that Lausanne Radical Discipleship Covenant 40 years ago. And it has affected world missions radically ever since, and not in a positive way. And that's the world we live in. So when I say my title of my presentation today is Death by a Thousand Cuts, it's that type of thing, a little here, a little there, a little cut here, a little cut here, and eventually, evangelicalism has lost its focus on the gospel of Jesus Christ and the proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it's not just here, it's worldwide, but um, I consider it to be a problem. I consider this to fit into the prophecies of the end time that there will be a great apostasy. Uh, that the church, of the end time church, will be a Laodicean church that will mix, will have some good, they'll have cold, hot and cold, and the result will be that Jesus will want to spit it out of his mouth because it's so distasteful. As we said when we talked about apostasy a few weeks ago, chew the meat and spit out the bones is not something a true shepherd would say to the sheep that, is, that are in his flock. Well, so there's that. And the world we live in, uh, particularly in the Middle East and elsewhere, you know, it's one of these weeks where you just want to look. This is a, um, a long dormant, uh, for centuries dormant, volcano in Indonesia that's now erupting. We talk about the, the drought crisis in California, and it's gotten serious. Uh, people in California are being asked not to wash their cars. That's pretty serious in a car-based culture in California, let me tell you. But also, uh, in the, throughout the Americas, this is happening. Sao Paulo, which is a huge city, what is it, 25 million people live in Sao Paulo, Brazil. The water source that supplies about 6 million of those people is now at 5% of capacity. Rio de Janeiro and Sao Paulo are having a pretty big fight over water sources. Sao Paulo is trying, they live upstream, they're trying to grab the water. Rio de Janeiro, which is another huge city of millions of people, says, hey, wait a minute, what about us? What about us? And uh, they're having a battle, literally a battle over who's going to get control of the water sources. And California continues to go downhill. Culturally, this week, yet another problem. Um, the high court, the U.S. Supreme Court just said, hey, we're not going to hear any of these cases that have struck down uh, traditional marriage amendments. So now, 
I think it's 30 or 35 states have um, gay marriage, same-sex marriage. Some states like Arizona and Ohio think that it's going to be coming about pretty soon as theirs are cut down. Now listen, people, Francis Schaeffer, for example, said if when Roe versus Wade came out, he said eventually we're going to have euthanasia. And now we have a lady that's 29 years old on Facebook or the internet, YouTube, whatever, touting the fact that she's going to end her life. Um, I think she's 29 years old. Francis Schaefer said, you start killing babies in the womb, this is eventually what's going to happen. People have said, look, you have allowed marriage between two men, two women. What's to stop polygamy? What's to stop other forms of sexual perversion from coming out? And so this week, exhibit B, I guess, in my uh, little presentation here today, is an editorial in the New York Times that appeared on Tuesday, I'm sorry, Monday, this, a week ago, this past Monday, called Pedophilia, a Disorder, Not a Crime. Now, folks, if, if you want to understand the, I, it's hard for me to sit here and not scream and yell and rant and rave. But this, is deep, this stuff is deeply, deeply troubling. Now, I know, and we talk about it all the time, that in Luke 17, Jesus said that at the end, it would be like the days of Noah, and it would also be like the days of Lot. We know that Lot lived in a perverse, wicked culture in Sodom and Gomorrah. It wasn't, as some people want to say, but they just weren't hospitable. Yeah, God sent down... Uh, judgment from heaven because they, they had a problem with hospitality. That's not the problem. And in fact, in 2 Peter chapter 2, it identifies the fact that Lot was oppressed by the wickedness that he saw around him. And so if you look at this stuff that's talked about in, the, in the, the, all the news that's fit to print, has on their op-ed page this week this article about we shouldn't be so hard on pedophiles, you know? It's just, don't worry about it. If you see articles, you should feel oppressed by that because our world is, it's coming apart. People are involved in such gr grievous sin that they've lost the ability to reason. That's Romans 1. That, when you look around the world, you should say, boy, this looks like, Paul writing in Romans 1. It is. It is that bad, culturally, morally, in our culture. The focus of our law should shift from punishment to treatment. So watch your kids. I mean, when you see high schools in our country, part of this whole gay marriage movement, folks, is to remove the distinctions between men and women. That's what ultimately is at the core. That is a slap in the face of God the Creator who created men and women. Now, when I have an opportunity to meet with the Creator someday personally, I'm sure I will, I want to unpack some of those mysteries because I don't understand that other part okay, that he created. You, you understand what I'm saying? There are, it's, it's, and it's a two-way street, baby. You know what? What, she, what I don't understand about her and the Hallmark Channel, I mean, she doesn't understand about me and golf or something. And so, um, and that's, you know, that's part of the beauty, that folks. Part of that is why gay marriage is so bad, because God created an institution where you will learn to love the other, okay? The other alien in your life, I guess, or whatever. <laughs> but it's, a, it's also a picture of a relationship with God because we have, but the gay marriage thing is you learn to love 
a mirror image of yourself. That's the problem. It's very, I hate to say this, narcissistic. It is. And that's, that's one of the biggest, because it's, it's contrary to God's plan. In California now, all institutions through public health plans are now required to provide abortion in those health plans. Came out this week. Now, when conservatives say there's a slippery slope, people say, oh, it's, you just say there's a slippery slope. There is a slope, folks, and the culture is going down. So a number of churches, uh, Foothill Church, Foothill Christian School, we know where that is because it's at Skyline Church, Shepherd of the Hills, Calvary Chapel, Chino Hills, have written a complaint letter to the uh, California Public Health Department, uh, Department of Managed Care. The letter says this, on November, August 22nd, the California Department of Managed Care notified all private health care insurers in the state, including those through whom complainants purchase their employee plan, that all health care plans issued in California must immediately cover elective abortions. The Department of Managed Health Care justified this change in policy by interpreting the applicable California law mandating coverage of basic health care service to require coverage for all abortions. Forty-one. Um, 31 years after, no, 41 years, 41 years after Roe versus Wade, this is where we've gone. They don't care if you're a church, there's no religious exemption. They don't care what federal law says, that you have to allow religious exemptions. California says we know better. I think there's a connection, frankly, between the way California acts and the fact that they don't have any water, or they're almost out of water. And then this, you know, as we live in this world, lethal illness, and terrorvirus, D68 takes another child. We have that, Africa now in America. We have Ebola running rampant. Uh, in uh, Sierra Leone, it's, uh, they have very, um, well-developed traditions about uh, burial, funerals and burial. And now the bodies are being taken away to be cremated because they're not safe to handle. And officials admitted defeat by Ebola in Sierra Leone. In fact, they're telling families now to care for victims at home because the clinics have no room. This in the Daily Telegraph this morning. Ebola may have spread to Britain. This picture of a Dallas uh, sheriff who went out to take care of the Ebola victim that had ended up in Dallas and flowed in from Liberia uh, is now being under observation for that. Um, and yet, you know, we, I talk about this too, is this deception, this kind of craziness that happens in our world and culture. We're still having people fly in. It's like, it's like 15,000 people a day from the uh, areas where there's Ebola are flying all over the world. 15 or 30,000 people every day. You think, do you think it's contained? This is, this is troubling. I mean, healthcare worker at Dallas Presbyterian Hospital who cared for the gentleman who died from Ebola this week now has, is testing positive for Ebola. Um, these are people who are walking around in hazmat suits, air respirators, and that type of thing. So we talked a little bit about last week about how this uh, re may relate to uh, some of this, one of the seals that's open, uh, one of the horsemen of the apocalypse in the fourth seal, third or fourth seal. Uh, other pr areas of the country have problems, or the world. Kim Jong. Kim Jong Sun L, whatever his name is, is missing. Um, he hasn't been seen for a month. People believe that other family members are now in charge. Uh, one of the most oppressive countries. 
And then this, we have this continuing problem with Islam. And if you give me about 10 more minutes, we'll do this. Because this is another area where people in the world just seem to lose their ability to reason. Now, <clears throat> I've done my best to try to clean up all of the language. Um, I think I got it all. But uh, Sam Harris, who is a atheist, was on Bill Maher the other night. I don't know if any of you have seen this, uh, some of these tapes. Uh, with um, uh, Ben Affleck, uh, Michael, I can't remember his last name, he used to be chair of the Republican Party, and uh, Nicholas Kristof, a uh, lunatic writer for the New York Times, columnist for the New York Times, and you'll see why in just a moment. And they talked about Islam. What, what about Islam? Now, you know it's a sign of the apocalypse when your views line up with Bill Maher, okay? <laughs> um, but uh, here's just a little bit of what was said. Sam Harris is going to talk first. Liberals uh, have really failed on the topic of theocracy. They, they, they'll, they'll criticize white theocracy. They'll criticize right. Christians. <laughs> they'll still get agitated over the abortion clinic bombing that happened in 1984. But when, <laughs> when you want to talk about the treatment of women and homosexuals and free thinkers and, and public intellectuals in the Muslim world, uh, I would argue that li liberals have failed us. And uh, the crucial point of confusion, uh, yeah, well, thank you. Thank God you're here. Yeah. So, I mean, the, the, the crucial point of confusion is that, that we have been sold this meme of Islamophobia where every criticism of the doctrine of Islam gets conflated with bigotry toward Muslims as people. Right. And that is uh, it's, it's intellectually ridiculous. So, even it gets so hold on, are racist. you the person who understands the officially codified doctrine of Islam? This is uh, the interpreter well, of that, well, so you well, can say, well, I, this I'm, is, I'm, I think I'm any- I'm actually well, well educated on this topic. I'm, I'm asking you, so I mean, you're you, saying if I criticize the, you're saying that Islamophobia is not a real thing. That if you're critical of something- it, Well, it's not a real thing when we do it. Right. <laughs> well, well, no, it no, really no, isn't. I, I'm not denying not, that, that certain people are bigoted against Muslims as people. That, right. And that's a that's problem. Big of you. But the. But why are you so hostile to, about this? It's, yeah. it's gross. It's racist. It's, it's not. It's, but it's so nice. It's, so, it's like saying it's so not a shifty Jew. You're not listening Absolutely to not. what well, we are saying. You guys are saying, if you want to be liberals, believe in liberal principles, right. like freedom of speech, like, right. um, you know, we are endowed by our uh, forefathers with an inalienable life, like all men are created no. equal. No, Ben, we have to be able to criticize bad ideas. And of course we do. Islam, no liberal doesn't okay, want to okay. criticize bad ideas. But Islam but why at this moment is the mother load of bad ideas. Jesus. So we have, we have That's ideas just a like, fact. like blasphemy. Oh, it is it's a, an ugly a, apostasy. It is it's basic liberal but, well, let me unpack it. tolerance. Let me, yeah, let, exactly. let me unpack it. But not it for bit. intolerance. No, of course it's not. But the picture you're painting is to some extent true, but it's hugely incomplete. It is certainly true that plenty of fanatics and jihadis are Muslim. But the people who are standing up to them, Malala, uh, Muhammad Ali uh, yes. Dadak in, in Iran, in prison for nine years for speaking up for Christians. Uh, a friend that I had in Pakistan who was shot this year, uh, Rashid Rahman, for defending people okay. accused of apostasy. Okay. Nick, or how about the more than a billion those, people who those aren't are fanatical, too. who don't punish well, women, who just want to go to the store okay, wait a second. 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 That's just not true, Ben. That's just not ben. true. Can, can I, can I just express how I think it breaks down? The, 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 the idea, you, know, you haven't even the, defined the, it. You're, you're trying to say that these few people, that's all the problem is, these few bad apples. The idea that someone should be killed if they leave mu the that's Islamic... That's horrible. That should okay. Wait, wait. That, that no, is wait. Temporary. You're saying that the idea way, that Islam. someone should be killed if they leave the Islamic religion is just a few bad apples? The people who would actually believe in an act that you murder somebody if they yes. have Islam yes. is not the majority of Muslims at okay. all. Okay, but is it? Let, let, me, let me break this. Oh, yeah? Well, that was Ben Affleck, who is the uh, star of the new Batman versus Superman movie. So I'm, I'm betting on Superman now, uh, just in a battle of wits. But listen to what Affleck said. Listen to what he said. If you want to be liberals, believe in liberal principles, right. like freedom of speech, like, right. um, you know, we are endowed by our uh, forefathers with an alienable life, like all men are created no. equal. No, Ben, we have...
Okay, let's try it one more time. Just so you, you make sure. If you want to be liberals, right. believe in liberal principles right. like freedom of speech, like right. um, you know we are endowed by our uh, forefathers with an alien life strike on their Okay, no. see, man, we have. Now the Babby and I knew growing up knew that the Declaration of Independence that we are endowed by our Creator, not by our forefathers. So the forefathers wrote it, but. Uh, and, and what, what Affleck does, though, is he makes this mistake where he puts um, Muslims above the scripture. They're the one, we talk to the Muslims about what, and we do that in Christianity, too, though. We put our own little things about uh, what the scripture says above what the scripture says. So bad there, it's bad here, but that's the way, it's the way he's learned. That's the culture in America is that, uh, I mean, I'm sure you've been to Bible studies, and it's like everybody goes around and says, like, okay, what does this scripture mean to you? I, I have a problem with that. <laughs> it's what does the scripture mean, okay? Your opinion may be right, but it's irrelevant. Let's find out what the scripture means. So the, the discussion continued. Michael Steele is the other guy that's involved. The the one reason skin. they don't get exposed is because they're afraid to speak out. Because that's, it's the only, oh. it's the, because it's the only it. religion that acts like the mafia that will kill you that's, if you say the wrong true. thing, I mean, draw the wrong picture, or write the wrong book. So you do and have, that's, yeah. that's, you do have, there's, there's a reason why Ian Hirsi Ali needs bodyguards 24-7. Yeah. Uh, and a little bit more. What is your solution? Muslim, what is your ask? No, the, 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 solu the solution. The no, 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 the solution to, is very much. What we've killed more Muslims than they've killed no, us by not, an awful lot. We've invaded more Muslims. I'm not for more killers. An awful lot. And yet somehow we're exempted you know, from okay. these things because they're not really right. a reflection of a, what yeah. we believe in. We did it by accident. That's why we invaded. We're Iraq not in okay. Okay. Land we're not. Well, uh, this man is uh, massively confused. Uh, Christoph wrote about it in his uh, column later in the week, and he, he said, yeah, boy, we went on for an hour afterwards. I'll be done in about three minutes here. First, historically, Islam was not particularly intolerant, and it initially elevated the status. I do not, how do you get, what is the qualification for getting a job with the New York Times? It is factually incorrect. Ben Affleck was wrong. You know, there's that, by the way, if, if you weren't here, uh, politicalislam.org or .com, Bill Warner, has a phenomenal series of videos, and he will show you the number of battles that were involved. Everybody says, oh, well, what about the Crusades? It was like 10 battles. Islam, since its founding through 1922, was involved in something like 580 battles and killed almost 300 million people, far, far more than were involved in holy wars and Christianity and all this other stuff. So first he says historically Islam was not in particularly intolerant and initially elevated the status of women. Anybody looking at the history of even 20th century would not single out Islam as the bloodthirsty religion. It was Christian, Nazi, communist Europe, and Buddhist, Taoist, Hindu, atheist Asia that set records for mass slaughter. It was atheist Asia. It was Nazi and communist Europe. What a he says this, third, the Islamic world contains multitudes. It is vast and varied. Yes, almost four out of five Afghans favor the death penalty for apostasy. But most Muslims say that, say that is nuts. In Indonesia, the most pop populous Muslim country in the world, only 16% of Muslims favor such a penalty. In Albania, Azerbaijan, and Kazakhstan, only 2% or fewer Muslims favor it, according to the Pew survey. Yeah, but what he doesn't tell you is, yeah, Indonesia says that. But if you look next door in Malaysia, answer the question, do you favor or oppose the following, the death penalty for people who leave the Muslim religion? Malay, you know, Indonesia, he's right, 16%. But what about Malaysia? It's a very populous Muslim country too, 58%. Believe it, it's right next door. So Afghanistan, 79%. So listen, uh, people are confused. I don't have time to go into this. We'll talk about it next well, the next time I do a prophecy update, but, you know, this is the world, Muslim world people, th this is, these are lines, this is the Washington Post front page this morning, showing all the different areas where, of the world where people, Muslims, are coming to fight on behalf of the Islamic State, ISIS, or ISIL, whatever you want to call it. Now, 
If there wasn't an ideology problem there, would these people be coming from all over? It's just, the facts just don't line up with anything that Ben Affleck was saying. So, here's how I want to conclude. Give me one moment. I could go for another couple hours, frankly. but No, I couldn't. <laughs> I could, but I would be alone. So, and Daniel, it talks about uh, the end will come like a flood. This is a video with no sound, so I want to talk about it just a moment. And, um, if there is sound, it's very, back in Boxing Day 2004, there was this tsunami in the South Pacific. This is, a, I think, a perfect picture of the world that we live in. The people were there and they were looking around and they're like, wow, all of a sudden the earthquake happened, but all the water drains out of the bay. And people are walking around like, wow, look at this, look at the coral and the rocks and all this stuff. And uh, boy, isn't this pretty? We, don't, we usually have to go snorkeling, we have to get in a boat to go out and see this. Now we can just walk around and look at all the pretty stuff. Then all of a sudden somebody says, hey, what's that? It's scary. Somebody starts to get aware. And you see it all the way across the high horizon is this massive wave. It's getting bigger and bigger. And the people, they're still out there. And you know from what happened, all these people are dead. They're walking around. Look at the, oh, look at those beauty rocks. Other people are saying, oh, wait a minute, something's going on. Something's happening. There's a flood. It looks like a flood coming. And somebody goes, what is that? What's going on? Did the earthquake affect the water? No, no, it couldn't have. Eventually, somebody says, it's a tsunami. Really? A tsunami? Somebody should warn people. Folks, that's why we do what we do here on the prophecy update and that type of things. Is I feel and I know Mike does. The leadership here at Fellowship Bible Chapel feels compelled to warn people about what's coming. Because all of the signs are there. And it's time that people wake up. We'll warn. And if you want to continue to walk around and look at the pretty rocks like nothing's happening, that's fine. But you need to know that God's judgment is coming upon the earth, and it's coming soon. And now, the scripture says, now, today, is the day of salvation. If you're not living the way you should, you need to repent and get your life cleaned up. If you've never accepted Christ, you need to repent and accept Christ as your Savior, because that's your only hope. Jesus will come. He will rescue us. But the judgment is coming, and it'll come like a flood. And I think this picture of the tsunami of what's happening is a perfect picture of that. So keep that in mind. That's why we do this every week. I know the news is not good. I know things seem crazy. They are. They're oppressive. But that's a sign of the end times. And we need to be aware of that. We need to be motivated to share the gospel with our friends, our neighbors, our relatives, and warn them. Because I, at this point, I, I, my, you know, my father thought Jesus was going to come soon. Okay, he taught that when I was a kid. I remember when I was a little kid, David Hawking comes. You know, I'm eight years old. You know, and Hawking looks like he's 20 feet tall. And talking about Jesus coming. Well, I know this: we're 50 years closer than we were then. We're getting closer and closer because the things are happening so quickly. So I so appreciate all of you letting us share these things that are on our hearts because I think it's really important. And, and I don't, this is not a pride point. There are very few churches that do this. And I so appreciate that you guys support us and everything with your gifts and everything to let us do that. And these, these guys over here are doing this great work on the audio and video. We joke about it a lot. But the message is getting out, folks. We had 
uh, just under 5,000 views of the things that we taught last week around the world. I have no idea how that's happened. So thank you very much for that. And let's seal our minds, seal our hearts, and get ready for Jesus coming. Oh. Right. Yeah, that's actually, thanks, I meant to mention that. It's actually been implemented. Uh, I think already in Lincoln, Nebraska, which is out, you know, I've been to Lincoln. It's it's out in the prairie, man. It's, you know, it's corn for 500 miles west of there, I think. So uh, it's a crazy world. Thanks, Lowell, for sharing that. So one more, and then we'll pray and go. Which poses the greatest danger to the world, America or ISIS? They talked with three students, and all three students said America. Right. That's education. <laughs> yeah. Well, if you want to hear a little bit more about that question, come to our conference on November 14th and 15th, because we have some, uh, we'll actually have some talks strictly on that topic. So, look, thanks for everything that you do and everything. Let's pray, and we'll leave. Father, thank you so much for... Um, our brothers who came halfway around the world to share with us today. Just a phenomenal message. And, Lord, I just pray that you would bless Finish Line uh, in, the, in the ministry that they do and the, the focus that they have on uh, sharing, proclaiming the gospel, and building and, and making disciples for you. Uh, pray that you will bless them financially. Pray that you will keep them healthy. Pray that you will give them protection uh, as they travel around. Pray that you will open doors for them uh, so that their ministry will flourish and that more people will be brought into the kingdom ready to meet your son when he returns. And Lord, we just pray that uh, you would fulfill all your, as Daniel prayed, we would pray that you would fulfill all of your prophecies, just as you wrote, had your prophets write in Scripture thousands of years ago. Keep us ready, steal our minds, steal our hearts, and bless us as we go. In Jesus' name, amen. Ooh. Mm -hmm.